300 people plus friends and stuff like that will definitely affect our beautiful, quiet area of Punta Gorda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Lux. Um, I have been sworn. I currently uh, own property in uh, Punta Gorda, and I intend to, uh, with my wife who just spoke, build on uh, the lot at the end of Colony Point. Now, we've heard so much this morning about all the benefits everyone's going to get. We're going to get a higher tax base. I won't have to lug my boat around. Um, my lot will magically go up $40,000 overnight. Okay, of course you're going to see a lot of blue shirts, right? Unfortunately, this is special, it's a special exception we're trying to approve here. The standard is not the benefit on the community. The standard is that the proposed use will not adversely affect neighboring properties. You just heard from Debbie. She has absolutely told you how her unique property and the one I intend to build on in the future, it will absolutely be adversely impacted, okay? The Pollocks told you the same thing. It is a definite negative impact. The beautiful view that they have, th that they purchased will be gone. That is the negative impact. That is the first standard, okay? That's not benefit, it, it's adverse, uh, adverse effect. Now, number two, compliance with a uh, comprehensive plan. We've also heard that, oh, it's in full compliance with a comprehensive plan. Well, if you cherry pick the ones that it complies with, of course you can say that. However, um, it was also shown by experts that, well, there are also parts of the comprehensive plan it does not fit, okay? The comprehensive plan says that um, it is a goal for us to preserve the environment, okay? That is clearly in the comprehensive plan. We're a boating community. However, we also respect the environment. That's why it's in the comprehensive plan. Um, and it's also noted that in order to do this cut through, you have to go through land which was zoned EP, Environmental Preserve, okay, which is owned by the state of Florida. You can't get out to Charlotte Harbor without it, or the Peace River w without going through it. Um, the whole purpose of EP zone property is environmental preserve, okay? Now, the interesting thing about a special exception, when you look at a special exception, it is, uh, it, it's a land use that is already kind of con contemplated with the zoning. However, it just needs a little extra look, okay? A little extra attention just to make sure by, by um, all of you. There is no way that destroying a wide section of mangroves is consistent with environmental protection. Absolutely contrary, and I don't see how this possibly came through as, as a special exception. Um, I, like uh, one of the experts said earlier, I think there was a, uh, there's a statutory issue involved, but this may be possibly a zoning issue, maybe a variance, definitely not a special exception. It does not qualify, and please, please do not approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kathy Polcari. I don't live in Vivanti. I don't live on Colony Point Drive. I don't live anywhere near it. But what this does for me, I came from Long Island, probably one of the biggest boating places in the nation. Um, my husband and I looked for a long time where we wanted to move to. We wanted something that we could have a house on a canal. They didn't have to trailer my boat anymore. I didn't have to store my boat anymore. It was beautiful. This is it, Punta Gorda. Even on the website, I could come here. This was my haven. The problem is, I also have a motorhome. Trying to find storage because of all the people that don't have boat access, that have to store their boats, is next to impossible. And this goes to anybody that is in a, let's say a condominium, or has a landlocked property, you can't store your boat next to your house, most places in Punta Gorda. It's against the rules. You have to pay for storage. Here you have a huge condo complex, tons of boats that are honestly taking up my storage spaces. <laughs> you know, and as a boater, I can tell you, you can't possibly go boating every single day. 
So for the people that you know say the wildlife and everything else, I live on a canal. I see all my neighbors. We don't go out every day. We can't possibly go out every day. Weather, canal height, to even be able to get out, you can't get out all the time. And the bald eagle, he lives on my canal. So if you're missing your bald eagle, please come get him, because he takes all the fish. <laughs> but, and that's really all I have to say. This is not, like I said, my property value is not gonna be increased. It's not gonna be decreased. I just know you guys have issues. You don't have enough space for all the boats. So we either take it off the website, this is no longer a boating community, or give them their boat slips. Thank you. Thank you. Line up, anybody else? Make your way to the line. <laughs> My name is Roseanne Cruz, I've been sworn in. I also live in Vivante and also have a property we bought on Colony Point Drive. Well, now there's a house there. And we bought the lot not knowing that well, knowing and maybe not knowing, there was gonna be a cut through. But if, when this does happen, there will be probably manatee coming in because the lake is air, will be aerated and I would be like a kid in a candy store being excited as heck, that's what my husband calls me, and going, manatees! Or there are um, different birds, ducks that migrate from Minnesota area to over here or from the cold weather. So we have plenty of um, wildlife in our canal, and I'm excited to have this cut through. Please approve this. Thank you. Uh, my name is Terry Davison. I'm an owner at Vivante. Um, I wanted to comment on the comment that our lake is a dead lake because I fish in it and catch snook and tarpon all the time. Uh, my view over, over the lagoon, our lagoon, uh, we have wildlife and ducks diving, eating, flourishing in there. Um, I don't see how we're being detrimental to Colony Point. Um, dredging a channel doesn't detriment their view that much. They still have the same view. So a boat goes by once in a while. I mean, how are we detrimental to them? Uh, I just wanted to make those points, and I hope you approve this. Thank you. My name, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have been sworn in. My name is Linda Kaufman. I'm an owner at Colony Point. Um, there's been some poo-pooing about the dolphin, how they love to follow the boats, how the Vivante um, cut-through will not impact that. Well, in the um, shallow water that they're proposing to not only cut through the mangroves, but cut through the water too, there are not only crabs, there are not only salamanders. Um, the horseshoe crab is on the um, potentially endangered list. And we've been seeing horseshoe crabs out there all, at least for two weeks. Um, the dolphin love to take their babies up into that quiet little corner and teach them how to fish. The manatee take their babies into that corner and nibble at the vegetation. So yes, there will be a very real impact on the wildlife that will no longer be there. Since Vivante was finished being bought out, most of the condos there, the two families of ground owls that used to live on Colony Point Drive have moved within the last six years. They don't live there anymore at all. It's not from the traffic that went in and out of Colony Point because that traffic was always there. It's been there for the last 40 years. So I can only wonder if it wasn't the increase in the population along Colony Point Drive from the Vivante complex. We've also been poo-pooed about the number of boats. Oh, it won't be a boat highway. That won't happen. They're proposing 296 
boat slips. If 10% of those boats go out daily, that's 30 boats a day. If one boat goes out every five minutes, that is two and a half hours of boating traffic in my backyard, only going out. Then they come back. So that's another two and a half hours of boating traffic, one right after the other, or maybe not. Maybe they stretch it out to every 10 minutes. So then it's five hours out and five hours back in. So you can't tell me that's not a highway, a boating highway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. One other thing. Um, in the Supreme Court of Florida decision dated September 29th, 2008, beachfront property owners have special rights known as littoral rights with respect to their properties. These rights include the right of access to the water, the right to reasonably use the water, the right to accretion and relixion, which is about the flow of the water and the silt that comes in, and the right to the unobstructed view of the water. Thank you. Thank you all. Anybody else? Last call. Do you need to form the line if you would like to speak on this uh, special exception? Hello, uh, my name's Mike. Hold on one second. Anybody else? This is the third call, third and final call. <coughs> Go ahead. Okay, uh, my name's Mike Chapman. I've been sworn in. Um, my wife and I bought pre construction in Bavante in 2005. And uh, when we were looking at the original plans, it showed that finger, dog leg, or whatever going out to Charlotte Harbor. And they were telling us that, yeah, there were good possibility that it could happen. That's the way it was designed. Um, we're here for only five to six months of the year right now. We own a boat. We had a boat down here for a couple of years. Had it at a friend's house. Wasn't working out. They ended up selling their house. I had my, had it in storage at Pineapple Storage over by I-75. That was a headache. I ended up taking it back to Michigan. So yeah, there was a big shortage of slips, um, not, yeah, slips and um, boat, boat launch parking spots. Uh, we'd love to have access to the harbor, as most of the PGI does, and, and eliminate the hassle of searching for those ramps and the parking. Um, we've had, the, in the past, we've had to haul it all the way to Lettuce Lake. I don't know if you guys know where Lettuce Lake is. It's way up 17 way up by the navigator. That's, that's not very convenient. Um, I also own a lot on Colony Point Drive. Um, I, two years I plan on building a home there. Uh, I've been moving down here full time. So I respectfully ask for your consideration in this and to pass it. We're all in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Last call. He's the last one, unless you jump up now. And Somebody's got to be there. last. <laughs> Jack Nicklin, I've been sworn in. Uh, I'm not an owner of uh, Viante or Colony Point. Uh, we are in a boating community. I live in PGI. I've been here for 18 years. I'd like to see the board uh, approve this development. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Do you want to sum up before we close the public hearing and then we'll start our deliberations? Again, Rob Bernson, Big W Law Firm. Um, just in summation, I don't believe there was any competent substantial uh, testimony that changes uh, the fact that we have met the criteria for the granting of a special exception. You've heard overwhelming support for that special exception, but that's not legally uh, what's required for this hearing. What's required is to meet the criteria for the granting of the special exception. Your staff has found we did. Your planning commission found that we did. And I submit to you that our application did as well and respectfully request your approval. Thank you. Any questions for, if they come up during our deliberations, then we'll, we'll let you know. You want a motion to close? Yes. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
carried unanimously. Um, do you want to just take a minute to address the legality of the application one more time? Well, the application required the applicant to, um, to assert under oath that, uh, and subject to penalties of perjury, that they were the owner uh, of the property and were authorized to submit the application. Um, the city is not the judge of ownership uh, or the judge of the um, legal effect of the documents that um, would uh, uh, relate to ownership. Uh, we take that issue at face value. The city's action pursuant to that application does not change this, the conditions that may exist. There are allegations that maybe there's something that's not um, uh, appropriate, but that would be up for the court to determine, not the city. Thank you. And from a staff perspective, was there ever any permit approved for any such project as this in the past? Uh, Lisa Hannon, zoning official, for the record, uh, not to my knowledge, okay. no, but that is why we do have that caveat in the code, so we can consider these as a special exception and with conditions to be added. Thank you. Yes. Quick question for David. Um, realizing that this request is to approve the concept of a cut-through and only that, um, there was quite a bit of testimony regarding cutting down mangroves, which has no relevance to this, I don't believe, does it? Well, as part of the considerations for um, the use, the related impacts to those uses are relevant. Okay. And I think, and I think uh, Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong, but in staff's re evaluation of the potential environmental impacts, um, those uh, would be addressed more appropriately by the agencies with the expertise okay. um, and, uh, and our knowledge of those regulations do require mitigation for um, adverse impacts to the environment. So you know, we take that into consideration that, uh, that those, those resources um, could receive protection uh, down the road. Questions for staff, any other questions? Do you want to go through um, real quickly the conditions again? Because this actually does give um, not just the use, but the ability to provide a docking facility and to those structures, seawall, that. Well, those are all within the use. Okay. And so, so let's talk about the criteria of consideration for approval of a special exception. And uh, you're not asking for the justification. You just want a reminder of what those criteria are? No, the conditions. The conditions. The conditions, oh, oh, the conditions for approval. Are the, I'm sorry. And did the Planning Commission suggest any other conditions? No, ma'am. Okay. So it would be page four or five, I believe, of your staff report. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll read the, um, you want me to read the conditions again? Yes. Okay. Uh, staff recommended conditions of approval. Number one, the city by way of its special exception approval expressly prohibits the lease or sale of slips within the Vivante Boat Basin to anyone but a member of the PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association Incorporated owner or resident. Violation of this condition is a violation of Chapter 26, Article 3.5, Parent B, Parent 3, which states in part, owners or occupants of the adjacent upland property may not rent docks to be used by third parties. Condition number two, the PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association Incorporated Restrictive Covenants be amended to include the restriction that when the docks are constructed in the Vivante Boat Basin, the docks can only be sold or leased to a member of the PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association Incorporated and will be for the sole use of member or resident only. Condition number three, the approval of the private boat slips within the Vivante Basin is subject to the approval of the canal construction special permit application. If approved, all docks will require a separate permit through the building and or engineering division prior to construction. Number four, the private boat slips proposed along the undeveloped multifamily lots cannot be constructed until the property is developed and a certificate of occupancy has been issued. Condition number five, Boat slips for the individual properties abutting the lake along Colony Point will require separate permits through the building and or engineering division prior to installation. 
Condition number six, additional permitting through all appropriate federal and state agencies, including but not limited to the Army Corps of Engineers, Southwest Florida Water Management, Florida Department of Environmental Protection is necessary and the permit permitting process is ongoing and the full responsibility of the applicant. And now for the benefit of um, th th those that were that are watching and the gentleman that wanted to know um, how you were going to, the reasoning for your voting one way or the other, okay. I will just um, remind uh, the council that um, there are four criteria that are listed on pages two through four of the staff's report and recommendation. Those criteria are what you are to base your decision on, um, whether there's competent and substantial testimony uh, in the record that's been presented today, including the documents as to each of those four criteria being met, or if any of the criteria was not met in your collective opinion, that would be a basis for denial. Okay. I'm in agreement with staff's recommendation that it's in compliance. I'm, I'm as well, and I, I say this because um, when it comes to the comp plan, um, one can pull competing interest out, but it's a holistic benefit to the city. And this is a comprehensive plan. And regarding the environmental issues, again, as stated in the staff plan, those will be addressed by the permitting. I mean, if, if, it, if it's not environmentally correct, it won't be approved. And so that's really not within our purview. And, and I do believe that um, in any issues of, of ownership, again, the courts are going to deal with that. I think we can't leave our little box. We have to live with that. Any other comments? Well, I guess I have to say something since yes. it's in my <laughs> district. Um, <clears throat> all, of the, all of these developments have come to us from time to time for special considers considerations. Colony Point also being one of them uh, relative to a paving and driveway uh, thing that they're going to be doing in the future, as I recall in the past. Um, <clears throat> it's not of our expertise to sort out some of these legal issues that are being presented to us. Uh, respectfully, we've heard uh, very competent expert testimony on both sides that were conflicting. Um, I feel confident if I ask a question about whether it's a brackish lake or a quiet lake, uh, a, 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 a freshwater lake or a brackish lake based on my personal expertises. However, when it comes to legal manners, I have to uh, default uh, to, to the, those of that profession and specifically to our council here uh, within our, and with our staff. Uh, in that regard, our responsibility is to go whether or not to, we would give our blessing to go forward before they get their permitting. This is similar, but almost the opposite case of the bird cut through. And the bird cut through, the city is, at, is going to be required to make a financial investment in the purchase of property. And I remember in discussions that I had going into that is, is that before we go do anything like that, we need to find out can we permit it first. And in other words, I th in that case, I thought we had to cart before the horse. And by going through the permitting process, we could find out if we could permit it before we had to make any investment. This is the reverse. Mm -hmm. The land is already owned by somebody. It's not being uh, an investment by the city itself. So in this case, they need to know whether we're going to give our blessing before they go for the permitting process. So it's really the reverse situation. Um, I believe it's, uh, if necessary, it's for the courts to sort out uh, the, uh, the legalities of it. It, but uh, from my perspective, I'm inclined to uh, uh, give my blessing to go forward. I think it's good for the community as a whole, and uh, as uh, Councilman uh, Cummings mentioned, holistically. Uh, and uh, uh, so with that, I'm saying I'm, I'm tending to, at this point, want to say that I think we should give our blessing and go forward. And it was incorporated into our strategic plan to explore Absolutely. any other additional harbor access points. Absolutely. Um, a couple of things. Uh, going into the building of the Vivanti complex, I was on the planning commission at that time and I was ch the chair of the planning commission. Um, I met with the owners of the, pro the project before it even broke ground several different times. And it was always the intent of Vivanti to become a waterfront community <coughs> at some point in the future. 
they tried several different options, none of which were very acceptable. Um, and I said from the very beginning, this, Gabe Bob and I had this very conversation. I said, you need to go straight out north in the harbor. That's the only logical way that this is gonna work. And this has been the least invasive way of getting that done. And I said that back in 2004 or five, whenever it was that I met with him. Um, I, I can say that honestly, I don't have a problem with the way that this is being proposed. And I think that it's, I, I understand no one likes change. I appreciate that very much. Um, I, live, I live on the Rim Canal and I get on a very, very busy weekend in season, if I get 20 boats past my house in a day, it, it's a lot. And quite frankly, I have several hundred, several hundred single family homes and condos that go past my house with their boat. Um, I live in the bird section on the Rim Canal. And, and so there is boat traffic, but that's, we're a boating community. And, and I have to stick with that. I mean, that's the real bottom line of this. We, we are trying to be boater friendly. We're trying to accommodate um, the citizens of the community the best we know how. And I think that this project makes perfect sense for Vivanti. Um, in, for me, in review of um, staff's criteria, I can't disagree with it. Um, I respect the opinion of the residents of Colony Point and, and what they have enjoyed and the people that who have property on Colony Point and what they have enjoyed. Um, as, um, I don't believe it's gonna be disruptive because I don't believe there's gonna be that much traffic. No. And, and to have a few um, navigation aids sticking out of the water is really not going to be um, uh, sign pollution as we might experience <laughs> on our streets. Um, I'm with you, Lynn, as I said before, um, you know, with all the, the potential boat traffic that could go by my home, it doesn't. Um, and most people enjoy seeing a, a boat go by. Um, and I think it's, I think as it's been expressed that there's potential for a win-win for Colony Point as this could move forward as well. So I think from that standpoint, the way it's been expressed, um, it could be uh, long term. Um, I think that it's a potential um, that could be advantageous there. So um, I would agree with it. Yes, let me also add, um, the developer of this project has, um, has really gone back to the drawing board. They removed the jetty wall, which was an obstruction that everybody objected to before. Mm -hmm. There isn't going to be any obstruction of the line of sight onto the harbor. There's gonna be a couple of dock pilings, which in, if you look in any direction in Punta Gorda, you're gonna see dock pilings. So I don't think that that's gonna be an issue for anybody as far as the, the line of sight and view to the harbor. And right now you have several boats that go by those condos every day anyway. I, that's just my personal opinion and I am a boater, but I, I, I can tell you my boat hasn't been off the dock since October. So, I mean, boating superhighway, I don't agree with that. I just don't agree with that. And I don't, I can't, I can't accept that as a, as a reason to deny. Yes. Can I move to? Uh, yes. Okay, I, uh, I move that we uh, accept SC 04 16. With all of the conditions. Uh, with all the conditions therefore discussed. If, if you might, let me, if, may I suggest a proposed motion? Sure, absolutely. All right. Based on the evidence, the competent evidence and testimony presented in this record in SE-04-16, um, move to approve the special exception um, subject to the six conditions that were provided for in the staff's recommendation and report. I so move. Second. So we have a motion and a second to approve with the conditions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Now we get to move on. Now we get to move on to CCSP. Does anybody else need another break? I'm not right this second. Okay. Nothing we said. They're all living. Okay. Might as well. Okay. That's fine. Okay, 
we are back in session and moving on to our next quasi-judicial hearing, which is CCSP 24-17. Uh, don't know if anybody else needs to be sworn. I don't think so. It's like about the same people. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Wake up. Wake up. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, CCSP-24-17, a petition by Hans Wilson agent on behalf of PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association, Inc., Vent LLC, um, of Vivanti at... Punta Gorda Property Owners Association, Inc., and Palm Island, Palm Isles Condominium Development, LLC, jointly as a prop, as property owners for a special permit under the provisions of Section 6-6J, Punta Gorda Code, to construct docking facilities with up to 255 private dock slips for the sole use of the residents of the Vivanti development. Permit up to 41 private docking boat slips for properties along Colony Point Drive with lake frontage for a total of 296 dock slips in a private waterway not dedicated to the public. Thank you. You can make it through your timer. So now we'll have the city staff present their application. They have 30 minutes. Okay. Um, I promise I won't take anywhere near that long to, uh, to explain the, the application before you. Um, again, Bob Nicola, Public Works. I have been sworn. Uh, this application has been uh, reviewed by city staff, uh, both Public Works uh, uh, and, and our zoning uh, development uh, departments. Uh, we, uh, before you is, is an application that, that includes uh, boat slips, uh, uh, docking facilities to be constructed at the multifamily Vivanti development as well as the single family homes on the west side of Colony Point uh, or the single family zoned properties on the west side of Colony Point. Um, in reviewing this, uh, we've looked at uh, many sections of chapter six uh, of, the, of the code and um, there's been some mention about the uh, uh, section uh, subsection D that that speaks of other waterways and the staff certainly does recognize this is not a, a platted canal situation and uh, in reviewing that we we feel that the uh, geometry and layout of the docking facilities at the multifamily zone properties is uh, is is something that we would recommend approval on, uh, although it does exceed the 80-foot maximum length. Uh, in some some discussions that we've had uh, with staff, uh, that section D, other waterways, uh, was uh, it was at least suggested that it was for properties that were along the harbor or the river and needed to go that far out to get to uh, deep enough water. In this particular location. The depth of the water uh, makes it difficult to create docking facilities uh, other than, than a floating type uh, dock, uh, similar to what we have in, in Lashley Marina. And it's for that reason that, that while we agree with the layout and geometry of, of that uh, multifamily docking facility, we do strongly recommend that they be constructed of floating concrete uh, as opposed to what's found in the other waterway section that does describe um, freestanding docks that are constructed of either <coughs> concrete or wood. We would strongly uh, recommend against um, any type of wood facility. Uh, shifting over to the single family property side, um, just the opposite applies. Uh, staff review and recommendation would be that the construction behind those single-family properties be more in line or compatible with what is found in our city code for construction along pl platted canals. Uh, in my staff report or staff memo, I mentioned 6-6A, uh, 6-6C1, uh, also 6-6C3A, B, and C, 6-6C4, and 6-6K. 
essentially what that would provide or allow the uh, property owners to, to build uh, docking uh, or docks constructed of concrete, freestanding concrete docks, uh, no more than 10 feet in width, and um, also the, uh, the mooring of boats or installation of boat lifts would be in keeping with the uh, offsets or water, waterward distances for construction seen along uh, single family homes along platted canals. I believe that would establish some type of uniformity uh, allowed in that waterway. Uh, it, would, uh, it would certainly be in keeping with our, with our uh, code, with the zoning that's present for the properties across the, uh, uh, st the street and, and also create a good line of sight for, uh, for neighbors who, who uh, believe that, the, uh, that nature and, and in the previous discussion you heard testimony about, uh, about their, their views and unobstructed views. Uh, in considering the granting of a, the petition for special permit, we, we looked at section 6-6J4, uh, the six prong test. Uh, we believe that, uh, that with the staff recommendations that the application uh, would be in uh, general, or would be in harmony with the general intent and purpose of, of subsection 6-6C. Uh, we find that uh, the docking facilities proposed would not be injurious to the waterway involved. Um, further, it would not impede safe navigation. We believe that the layout and geometry of the, of the docking facilities at Vivanti provides uh, safe navigation uh, or, or canal widths or widths between docking facilities that, that provide for that. Um, would not allow structures or uses that are aesthetically or functionally incompatible with existing structures or uses on surrounding lands. Uh, that was, again, the uh, uh, strong staff recommendation that, that the single family properties uh, develop with those, within those uh, code sections that I outlined. Um, further, we, we, would, we do not believe that uh, approving this permit would allow any structure or activity that would interfere, interfere with or be detrimental to the quiet and peaceful use and enjoyment of nearby lands. Um, and we also do not believe that it would create any detriment to public health, welfare, or safety. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the specifics of the application. Uh, I'm quite sure the applicant will go into some detail with that as well. So the general idea is that on the deeper waters, it's floating, but on the other side where there's the lots, it'll be regular piling dock situation, one per lot. Correct. Uh, the, the applicant uh, originally had proposed 41 slips on the single family property side. Um, in reviewing those 32 lots, what I've been able to determine is two of those properties have less than 80 feet of seawall. Um, there are eight with greater than 80 feet. Actually, they have 90 feet of seawall. And the, uh, the other 22 have 80 feet of seawall. Uh, city code currently allows, if uh, it, it really makes a differentiation between more than 85 feet of seawall or less than. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if you have more than 85 seat, feet of seawall, um, the code provides for constructing docks as opposed to with uh, less than 85. It talks about a dock. Uh, the other differentiation is the number of lifts allowed. Um, more than 85 feet of seawall, you can have two boat lifts without requiring a special permit. Um, so uh, again, with the recommendations that, that are presented, it, it would provide for construction within the 45 degree angles. Um, and uh, in reality, um, we c I've come up with a slightly different number than what the applicant says if, if the slips are to be equated with boat lifts. Um, currently, uh, the way that those properties are configured, I believe that there could be up to um, 40 boat lifts. Uh, 16 
a total of 16 at the 90 foot lots and then 24 at the lots with 80 feet or less of seawall. So, uh, but again, the, the recommendation would be a standard um, concrete freestanding dock, um, either with wood pilings or, or concrete pilings. Qu clarification, are you saying that, that based on your calculations that more slips would be permissible than what the applicant is asking for or less? Less. One less. Uh, the, the application said 41, and um, again, our, in reviewing this on the, the GIS, um, we believe that number to be 40 without requiring a special permit. The properties at either end of, of the 32, and particularly the one at the northern end, uh, their, their frontage along Colony Point is well in excess of 100 feet, although the, the lot angles um, severely, and so, you know, just scaling that off, it appears that they would have about 60 feet of seawall as opposed to, you know, over 100 feet of frontage on Colony Point. So are you recommending that instead of um, authorizing 296 slips that uh, only 295 be approved pursuant to a special permit? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, just a quick question. Um, as a point of reference, uh, in looking at the layout of the dock structure, uh, what do you anticipate is going to be the length of each of these long sets of finger docks? There's looks like some of them have four sets of pilings and some have three. Um, the, and I do have um, several sheets that, that go into some greater detail um, on that. The, the, um, the lengths of the, the uh, individual berthing slips vary between uh, uh, 30, 40, and 50 feet. Um, some of the, the T-shape, at, at the end of the T-shape uh, dock, um, I believe they would have the ability to uh, either combine slips or, or have a, a boat in, or boat slip in excess of 50 feet. But um, again, these, these docks, uh, we've got 30s and 40s and 50s, so that's the, the maximum uh, length of, of the slips. And the widths are, are generally uh, 13 uh, to 13 and a half feet in width. Sorry, I didn't see that in the, in the package. Okay, thank you. Can you just clarify again, none of those seawalls, even on the single family lots, are within the Punta Gorda Isles Canal Maintenance District, is that correct? They are not. None of them? None of them. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question. When I look at the area C, which is on the west side, I'm, um, and it's a page of the application and it shows the all the different docks in the area that those many of those um, some of which wouldn't be built yet because there are no condominiums on the the west side of that lake uh, correct that uh, and so when I'm looking at the one where it's showing widths and lengths and some of these um, where it shows that the, the actual dock is 110 feet. Um, it, it looks like they're very close, it, you know, from a navigation standpoint. And yet I realize that because there's a bridge that they have to go under to get out, the, right. it will limit the size of the vessel that might be in those. So, but it looked like it just looked like some of these, because of the length of the dock, they could be tight. The navigation could be tight. And uh, so. Well, you, you are correct. The, one of the controlling factors uh, for the, the boats that would be moored in, in this facility would be severely or, or regulated by uh, the, being able to cross under the, the bridge. Um, they do. Uh, the plan does show uh, 50 feet of, of uh, distance between the, the docking facilities. 
uh, in that location, and again, that's subject to the upland development. Um, those, those docks are all a maximum of 30, 30 feet in length uh, from, the, from the center walkway. Um, there's a total of uh, 76 of those docking facilities um, that would not be able to be constructed until such time uh, that the upland development is, is completed. It's, it's uh, these four docks here and, and as well as the one uh, to, the, to the right side of the screen. Um. I mean, I look at dock E and dock F and I see how close the ends of those are and I'm thinking, do we have enough space in there that somebody is for navigation? safe navigation? We believe there, there would be. Um, Just a question. Yeah. I think we could hear from the applicant. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good afternoon now. Rob Bernson, Big W Law Firm. I have been sworn in. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Hans Wilson in just a moment for him to uh, proceed with more of the technical side, but just for the housekeeping matter, I'd like to um, incorporate our sworn testimony from the prior hearing on our case in chief into this hearing so that you have all that background as it relates to this particular request. Um, I would just request that we leave the approval as we've requested. There was a calculation that was done that there could be 41 slips on the single family side. Um, we're not asking for more than would be entitled, but if we delete one because we think it might not be there, and then whoever's the last one to get there that could have had the last two slips but can't, or someone who we thought can only get one got two, and then one of the houses comes in and there's like, oh, 40, you're gone. I would leave it that way with the understanding and appropriate condition that the single family docks be approved up to 41 in accordance with city code. So if city code says if you have 85 or more, you get two, and the calculation at the end shows that that's what it is, that's fine. I'm just concerned if we cut one off because we think it might not make, make it and that it did in the real world that somebody's not gonna get a dock. I think he said too his calculation was based on a lift and a dock. Yeah, yeah that is correct, Mayor. Um, the, the 41 number was, was simply boat lifts. Um, there's, there's ample evidence of properties in the canal system that have 80 feet of, uh, of seawall frontage that have two uh, boats. There's, there's really nothing that limits in the code how many boats can be stored along an 80 foot lot as long as you stay within the limitation lines and that no construction of the structures extends outside the 45 degree angle. So, so wouldn't each yeah. individual permit take care of that then if we gave the maximum? Yeah, I just wanna make sure that this is, a, this is a request for a special permit. Mm -hmm. The special permit should identify the maximum number of um, slips that is being <coughs> approved. If based on staff's calculation, the maximum number of slips that should be approved is 295, then it should be 295. If, um, if there's enough uncertainty so that uh, we should go with the 296 and that the permitting will ultimately take care of itself, then we'll, we should do 296. And I'm just gonna leave it up to the staff as to how, how they want the city council to consider the, the um, approval of this special permit. Should it be 295 or 296? Well, again, I think at the multifamily properties, it's quite easy to say one, one boat per docking slip. At the single family side, um, it, it's not, the code is not as clear on the number of boats that might be stored. So um, I, I don't necessarily wanna use the term slip interchangeably with numbers of boats, but again, as part of the staff review, on trying to get to that 41 slip number, um, there was some speculation done on my part, but I believe that to be the Mac, the slip equated to boat lifts. And certainly uh, if, if we're using slip interchangeably with boat lifts, then it would be my recommendation that there's only 40 
at the single family properties, there's only up to 40 boat lifts permitted. Will there be more than 40 boats on the single family side? Perhaps there could be. You okay, could well, have somebody the, with two boats or. The request is with respect to the number of slips. So uh, Rob, can you support 296 maximum slips? Or can That's you my understanding from Mr. Wilson, uh, who will testify, and maybe we can leave that issue in abeyance Absolutely. to the conclusion Let's of his. The testimony ultimately will be on the number of <coughs> slips that are okay. permissible. You've heard staff 295. The applicant can support 296, perhaps. One slip, one slip. <laughs> but, but again, if I, it I was my <laughs> slip. It would be important. Well, that's yeah. what my concern is. Yeah. But again, if if we use the criteria um, in the staff report and staff recommendation uh, for as it relates to the single family properties, um, that will sort itself out. It, it we don't really in those sections refer to slips. It talks about the number of docks that can be built or where boats can be stored within the limitation lines or in relation to the 45 degree angles. With that, I would like to yes, so let Mr. Good. Wilson move forward and um, if there's any question at the conclusion of that, we can resolve it then. Okay, for the record and for this hearing, my name is Hans Wilson. I'm a licensed professional engineer with over 30 years experience as a marine engineer and environmental consultant, and I have been sworn in. The, uh, I'm gonna continue with the presentation I'd originally started with, moving into the special permit. Uh, part of the genesis of the dock design for this particular basin is predicated on the very deep water that exists in the basin system. As I noted in the PowerPoint, we've got on the average 20 feet of water depth. That's an exceptional water depth for most of our waterways. Great if you have a deep draft sailboat, uh, but a real problem if you're trying to build according to the city code, which stipulates concrete piling and concrete docks. Uh, a 20 foot long concrete piling, and that's just the water column, not to mention what would be above the water to support the dock, not to mention the penetration into the bottom, you're talking about a, a concrete piling that's on the order of 50 to 60 feet long. That's a huge single piling, and if you're trying to support a dock, typically your piling placement's 10 foot on center. So this would be a basin constituted of toothpicks is essentially what that comes down to. The more logical approach is to use a floating dock configuration, which is what we've proposed, and uh, for the Vivanti side, the reason why we're looking at the floating dock configuration aside from the water depths uh, is the access and control of access to the docks. Uh, floating docks, whether they're a floating concrete dock or a PVC encased polystyrene dock with an aluminum framing concrete deck, either way, those uh, docks are held into place with what we call an anchor pile. And generally an anchor pile is placed about every 40 linear feet along a dock or on the ends of the finger piers. It depends on the dock manufacturer. It depends on the wind loads. It depends on the vessels that are tied up to the facility. But on the average, it's about every 40 linear feet of dock that you would put in one single anchor pile. And this would basically be either a pre-stressed concrete piling to support that dock, or it could be a uh, a, a coated uh, steel piling. Again, it depends on the wind loading of the dock. So the solution to dealing with the piling issue was to go with the floating docks with the anchor piles. In the layout of the docks, uh, we could have gone with the, and I'll use the term inverted paramecium, which would have been this line of finger piers around the entire perimeter of the basin for each boat slip. Uh, and that could possibly have been consistent and would have been potentially consistent with the city code. However, the control of access to those docks uh, would be pretty limited. Uh, we've actually done what we call a stacked T configuration, where you have a set of finger pairs and then a couple of boats and another set of finger pairs and they're opposing each other. The design of the boat basin is based on the types of boats that are anticipated to use this waterway. We have a controlling depth proposed for the dredge channel of minus six mean low water. That's sufficient for the size vessels that are typical for this area. I'm sure there's some deep draft sailboats that would love to have six to seven, perhaps eight feet of water depth getting out into the waterway. 
uh, but we also have to be conscious about what the impacts are. We really looked hard at the single family on the east side of the basin and maintain the 50 foot of the, of the waterway width criteria in the land development code uh, between single family and the Vivanti development. And so you see a channel in there that is essentially running down the middle part of that north to south waterway on the east side of the property. When we get to where the waterway widened out, it didn't make sense to gerrymander the channel following the 50% or 50% uh, of the width of the water body alignment. And so part of the special permit is to consider more of a direct channel approach to the exit channel going into Charlotte Harbor. The uh, placement of the docks were tied in part to the upland facilities where they were located. Uh, to answer uh, Councilwoman Prafsky's question regarding the uh, design of the docks, uh, they were basically um, incorporated into or basically following a standard marina design that, and I can tell you, having been in this business over, I did a count the other day, over the last 15 years that I've been, of the 30 plus years I've been in this, I've done over 700 docking marina facilities. So I've been doing a lot of marina facilities. And depending on who's using the facility and the type of boats, we generally allow one and a half times the vessel length or the slip length for that fairway, which is the operating area between the docks. Mm -hmm. So in the graphic that staff showed you, it looks narrow and that's only because we've pulled the dimensions out away from the docks so you could see the dimensional configuration. So from a, from a, from a viewpoint of looking at the drawing, it looks cluttered. But when you take a look at the actual layout of the docks, it follows general design standards that we use, uh, particularly for those facilities where we've got, uh, like on the, on, the, on the west side, we've got smaller boats designed for that location. Those slips up to 30 foot. Now a slip, a 30 foot slip, really is harboring a vessel that's a 25 or 27 foot because you gotta account for a couple of feet for the engine on the back a couple of feet for the bow spirit in the front or the anchor. So those slips, recognizing that we've got a vertical limitation coming underneath the bridge, those are all smaller vessels. Mm -hmm. The area where we have no encumbrances vertically, we expect we'll have some larger vessels, sailboats, deep draft sailboats with masts. <clears throat> and so we've provided a, a, a slip distribution for that area that's commensurate with mm -hmm. what we expect the uses to be. And we've also provided a couple of docks where if someone wants to acquire two slips and put in one boat, it's one less boat in the mix, uh, but it uh, gives us a little bit of versatility in the docking structure for that application. And in all those cases, we've maintained that one and a half times the vessel length for the fairway design. Uh, the cross section I'm showing you here gives you a sense of the, the, the dry, I'm sorry, the wet slip storage for the floating docks on the left-hand side of the drawing, and then the typical concrete uh, dock that you would have on the right side. And this would be as if you were looking uh, to the north along the waterway with the single family residences on the right hand side of the drawing and then a representation of the floating dock configuration on the left hand side of the drawing. Now, this is not to scale uh, horizontally. We've got a, a break point shown in there, which is little zigzag lines. It's really just more to give you an idea of the relationship of the water depth and the placement of the anchor piles for the floating dock configuration. Um, have you tested for any rock? No, all? we have not done any core borings. We're really, to be honest with you, just trying to get through this local approval process so we can initiate <laughs> with the state and federal agencies. So that being said, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to make a, a note about usage. And that, I think, I think it's been spoken to pretty well regarding the, uh, the relationship of your automobile and how frequently you use that and boats. And a friend of mine, Denny O'Hearn, who is a Florida Fishermen's Association and who is fighting constantly to try and expand the opportunity to fish for red snapper. Red snapper has a very limited opportunity for you to go fishing. He said to me one, one time, he said, you know, Hans, boating is not about getting out on the water. He says, yes, it is to an extent, but what boating really represents is opportunity. 
You own a boat because it represents to you as the boat owner your opportunity to go boating when you want to. You may never use that boat the entire year, but by golly, if you want to, it's there and you can go. Now, I've looked at a lot of different facilities, uh, dry storage facilities, for example, down in our area, we've got some that are approximate to the Gulf of Mexico. Those dry storage facilities are set up as a concierge service. On, in general, on their busiest day, when it might be a Labor Day holiday, they might launch at best 20% of their entire boat population out of their dry storage facility. Now, this is a facility where you call them up and you say, I want to launch my boat and I want to leave at nine. When you pull up, They've already loaded up your cooler with your selection of snacks and beverages. They've already iced down your boat. They've already fueled it. You pull up and you get in your boat and you go boating. Okay, when you come back, you hand them the keys, say thank you very much, see you next time. You get in your car and go home. There's no schlepping stuff off the boat. There's no washing the boat down. All those features that go into actually having a wet slip. And if you're a boater like I am, it better be a doggone good day on the water to justify all the work that goes into loading that thing up, getting out there, and then when you come back, unloading everything. So in that regard, I think at best you're gonna see on a day-to-day -day basis, single-digit percentages of boats operating out of this marina facility. And excuse me, I apologize for using the term marina. I know it's a docking facility according to what we're discussing here, but in, in my world, any time that you've got more than a few boats tied up to a single docking facility, it becomes a marina. Uh, so I, I just use that as kind of my uh, professional vernacular. But I would be surprised if you saw more than single digit percentages exiting this docking facility on a weekly basis. And you might see on, the, on a big weekend, a Labor Day weekend or 4th of July or a boat parade weekend, you might see 18, 20% of those boats exit. And uh, with that, um, I don't think that we could really distinguish that from all of the rest of the boats that are also exiting Tarpon Canal and heading west into Charlotte Harbor to go fishing and boating. And so uh, that being said, the only thing I really wanted to point out here as my last slide is that um, you know we are in a high use residential land use area. We are in a prime location to maximize what resources are available to us for boating access. And I think one of the items that was submitted to you was some testimony from Sea Grant, and I believe that was the TP-186 study, but there's no question that we are gonna be short of boat slips in the future. And uh, from our perspective, and really, as an engineer, I try to exercise as much common sense as I can, given the, the limitations that we have to deal with in the world that we're living. Um, utilizing and maximizing existing resources makes a whole lot more sense than trying to try and create new. And I believe the reality is that you will pull people out of the boat ramps and out of the commercial marinas uh, that uh, currently reside in Vivanti when they have their own boat slip available to them. And from my perspective, uh, that increases access for those people that want to go boating but don't necessarily have waterfront access to do it. And I think that's really important for our boating community. Uh, I believe that that is it.